Hello everybody, it's Nerdgasm. Back in late 1971, Marvel readers got to experience one of the wildest Spider-Man stories ever published, The Six Arms Saga. It spanned issues 100, 101, and 102 of The Amazing Spider-Man, and is remembered mainly for the fact that within the story, Peter Parker grows an additional four arms, becoming a literal Spider-Man. But what is usually overlooked, or at least not focused on as much, is the debut of the villain Michael Morbius, the living vampire. Today, I want to review the Six Arms Saga, analyze it, share my thoughts on it, and see if it holds up after all these years. Does it rank up there as being one of the best Spider-Man stories? Is there more to it than just its seemingly ridiculous, multi-arm gimmick? Let's find out. Just like any other day, Spider-Man finds himself patrolling the streets of New York for trouble. He ends up catching a group of fleeing criminals, who had just robbed a bank. But afterwards, to his surprise, he finds himself bored with being a crime fighter. He doesn't seem to be satisfied with it as he once was. He used to think having powers made him better off than the people down below, but he feels being Spider-Man has trapped him on the sidelines, that he isn't really living. All Peter knows is that he loves Gwen Stacy and wants to spend the rest of his life with her. His secret of being Spider-Man is just going to make things more and more complicated the longer their relationship lasts. So, he has a crazy plan to kill Spider-Man so Peter Parker may live. Ever since he first received his spider powers, Peter had been working on an experimental serum that could potentially eliminate them. Why? Because he could never be certain that his radioactive blood would be dangerous. He feels now is the perfect time to test the potion and see if it works. It causes him to become dizzy, his head pounding, and he decides to sleep it off and let the serum go to work. Peter begins dreaming of all the sadness in his life, his guilt over the death of his Uncle Ben, how he was then forced to take care and support his Aunt May, his job at the Daily Bugle, and how Spider-Man is constantly under fire by his boss J. Jonah Jameson, how he lost out on a chance to be with Betty Brandt, who decided to marry Ned Leeds, and of course, his love for Gwen Stacy, and how she blames Spider-Man for the death of her father, Captain George Stacy, who had been killed by falling debris while saving a child during an encounter between Spider-Man and Dr. Octopus. In his dream, Peter battles with some of his deadliest enemies, the Vulture, the Lizard, Green Goblin, Dr. Octopus, and the Kingpin, before coming face to face with the spirit of George Stacy. He tells Peter that he must continue being Spider-Man, that he has been torturing himself with trying to live a normal life. Spider-Man is who he is and will always be. Spider-Man is Peter's blessing as well as his curse. While all this had been happening, Peter is feeling immense pain in the sides of his abdomen, which had been getting worse and worse as the dream went on. He awakens, regretting his decision to take the serum after thinking about Captain Stacy, and is horrified to discover that he had grown four additional arms in his sleep. Peter is still reeling over his nightmare, and the reality of his situation begins sinking in. The serum he created didn't get rid of his powers, they made everything worse, turned him into more of a spider, and if things weren't bad for him before, clinging onto walls and swinging through the sky on webs, now he's got six arms on top of that. He's become a freak. Gwen Stacy phones his apartment, wanting to go out and see a movie, an R-rated one no less, but Peter has to turn her down, telling her he is leaving town and doesn't know when he'll be back. Hey, cheer up, Pete. She might be into additional arms. You never know these days. There's a fetish for everything. Anyways, Peter receives another phone call shortly afterwards from Robbie Robertson at the Daily Bugle with a late night photo assignment for Peter. Of course, he has to reject it as well, which pisses off Jameson. So now he is on thin ice with both his boss and the love of his life. Damn. Peter makes one final phone call to Dr. Kurt Connors, asking him for help, 
and the good doctor allows Peter to stay at his summer house in Southampton, which has a fully equipped lab in the basement, which will come in handy. Peter arrives at the house, and we then cut to a large vessel off the coast, housing a crew of terrified sailors. Their men have been disappearing, including their captain, who was found dead. They blame the mysterious man currently in the hold that they had found stranded at sea. His name is Michael Morbius, and the sailors decide to confront him in the engine room. Morbius manages to escape their attack and hides out until nightfall when he returns, with a gaunt appearance resembling a vampire. He kills all of the sailors on board, draining them of their blood, and then, guilty over what he has done, attempts to commit suicide by diving into the harsh waters. Morbius survives and washes ashore. He finds Connors' summer house and flies into its empty belfry to sleep and avoid the sun's rays, which weaken him. As sunset approaches, Spider-Man is working on a cure for his condition in the lab and breaks a test tube in frustration, which awakens Morbius. Morbius then attacks Spider-Man, taking him off guard, and goes for his throat with his fangs to drain him of his blood. Their battle leads them up to the second floor of the house, and Spider-Man is punched off the railing by the villain. He is temporarily knocked unconscious, and as Morbius goes in for the kill, he is interrupted by Kurt Connors. Connors is then attacked by Morbius, and due to the stress of the ordeal, he is transformed into the lizard. Spider-Man wakes up and is met with two villains now. How fun! Morbius and the Lizard battle over who will get to kill Spider-Man. The Lizard is defeated when he is knocked into a piece of machinery and is electrocuted. Morbius then bites him before fleeing the scene. When the Lizard awakens, Spider-Man is surprised to find that Kurt Connors has been able to regain control over his mind and that his body has partially reverted back into human form. Connors believes that there may be an enzyme within Morbius's blood that could help both he and Peter cure themselves of their ailments. So, Spider-Man and Connors team up to take him down, with Connors seemingly having control over his lizard form, for the time being at least. Morbius hides out in a boarded-up cellar to sleep and thinks back to the events that caused his transformation. He had been on a yacht with his fiance and assistant, running experiments to cure himself of a rare degenerative blood disease. He puts himself through a strange form of shock treatment that will supposedly create blood cells, but the experiment backfires, turning him into a living vampire, and he kills his assistant, draining him of blood. To prevent himself from harming his fiance, Morbius jumps overboard in an attempt to kill himself, which I mean, doesn't seem to work for him, does it? As Spider-Man and the Lizard swing through New York in search of Morbius, the Lizard persona begins to take hold of Connors' mind once again, and in the struggle, he slips out of Spidey's grasp. Peter manages to save him, and Connors tells him that if they don't find Morbius soon, the next time that happens, the Lizard might try to kill Spider-Man. Thankfully, the heroes manage to locate Morbius and incapacitate him long enough for Connors to extract some of his blood, which transforms Connors back into his human form. Before Peter can take the rest of the serum, however, Morbius comes to and steals it, Spidey manages to catch a ride on Morbius by attaching some web to him, and after flying through the city for a bit, their villain, weakened by the sun, crashes into an overpass and falls into the river below. Peter attempts to rescue Morbius with the last of his web fluid, but only manages to grab the serum. How convenient! Dr. Connors is able to inject Spider-Man with the rest of the cure, and his additional arms disappear. Connors then tells Spider-Man that everyone has a monster locked away inside of them, waiting to destroy them. Peter was able to defeat his this day, but Morbius was not so lucky. So that concludes Spider-Man The Six Arms Saga. I love this story. While it does have a few zany moments within it, I think it's one of the most fascinating Spider-Man comics ever published. 
I think the idea of Peter Parker growing an additional set of arms is both really cool and really terrifying, like something out of those classic monster movies. He makes matters worse for himself by trying to get rid of his powers. He feels the populace of New York he tries to protect will see him as a monster, a freak, rather than a hero. I also think it's kind of hilarious when he tries to master these new limbs, because at first, his coordination with them is all off, making him smack into walls and struggle throwing punches in a fight. They just get in the way of everything. Something I find really impressive about this three-part story is how cohesive its narrative is, despite being written by two separate writers, Stan Lee for issue 100 and Roy Thomas for issues 101 and 102. Stan Lee had written the first 100 issues of The Amazing Spider-Man, and Thomas would become the first person other than Lee to receive a writer's credit on the series. Starting with issue 101 though, things would not be easy for him, as Lee played a fun little game of fuck over the new guy on his way out. Stan Lee rode off into the sunset, leaving behind a crazy concept, one Thomas would have to continue and resolve in some way, see it as the ultimate test form, an initiation among friends. The cover of The Amazing Spider-Man 100 promised a shocking ending, and boy, did Stan Lee deliver on that. The final page mentioned that the events that transpired were not part of some elaborate dream sequence or anything, they were the real deal, and that there would not be a cop-out in the following issue. Lee made sure that Thomas could not take the easy way out of the hole he had just dug him, which is quite humorous. But I mean, this is what writers live for, right? This kind of challenge. Roy Thomas would introduce the villain Michael Morbius, a very tragic and sympathetic character, forced to kill, drain blood, in order for himself to live on. In order to guarantee his own longevity, he is forced to give up a part of his humanity, which is a gruesome trade-off. Morbius is in many ways dead, and this story discusses themes regarding life and death itself, with both its hero and villain characters. Peter Parker believes he is no longer living as Spider-Man, stuck on the sidelines of existence, and forced to be a hero. He feels being Spider-Man is his curse, and growing additional urns, becoming a monster in many ways, further emphasizes that belief. And this story really centers around three men, who have all become monsters, who are all cursed in some way, and want to cure themselves of the ailments currently affecting their lives. Only one of them is truly successful though. Mind you, still on the fence with wanting to be Spider-Man or not, so maybe not really, he might still be cursed. Of course Morbius the living vampire would return, and has since become a staple antagonist within Spider-Man stories. Though more recent comics have depicted him in a much darker and violent way, making his first appearance in the Six Arms Saga look a bit tame by comparison, you have to realize it was a different time. The comics code authority had been weakening come the early 1970s. I mean, Stan Lee managed to attack the dangers of drug use in the storyline that preceded this one, with Harry Osborn overdosing on pills. So the landscape of the medium was definitely changing. Up until that point, a lot of comics related to monsters, especially vampires, were a no-no. I think the only reason Marvel were able to get away with Morbius at the time is because he wasn't technically a vampire, just looked like one and acted like one. That's all. I'd like to hear what you guys think of Spider-Man The Six Arms Saga though. Like I said, I really enjoy this storyline. I think it's got a lot of fun ideas in it, crazy ideas, but also manages to stick a pretty decent and thought-provoking landing. This comic review was not voted for over on Patreon.com. I chose it, and moving forward, I am going to try to review comics on a bi-weekly basis, make this a more frequent thing on my YouTube channel. I want to start reading comics more, and releasing more of these videos, because I enjoy talking about these stories, analyzing the characters and ideas featured in them. 
I want to continue to pad out the content on this channel in the hopes that I can bring in new viewers, new subscribers. I am still going to have the monthly polls accessible by my patrons to determine the long-winded superhero game reviews that I do, as well as access to the exclusive episodes of my podcast I release each month. But moving forward, if there are any specific comic reviews you want me to do, then you will have to nominate them by becoming a $10 producer of my channel or above over on Patreon. When you nominate a topic, you will fast track that video, and I will complete each one as they come in. Again, these comic reviews will be releasing on a bi-weekly basis. This decision was not made to fuck over my current patrons, who had been voting for comic reviews each month, because the way I see it, you will now be getting more of them, more frequently, and it allows me to look at a wide range of stories, ones I choose myself or ones you guys want me to look at specifically. I hope all of you understand these changes I have made. Managing a YouTube channel on top of working a full-time job can be quite overwhelming, and the more support I get through platforms such as Patreon, the easier it is for me to produce content like this. So all I can say is stay tuned. I have lots more comic reviews on the way, and I want to thank all of you for watching and supporting me thus far on YouTube and Patreon. Take care and stay nerdy. That's what I like most about you.